An absolutely devastating attack vector Kendrick Lamar can exploit is the numerous controversies surrounding Drake and underage girls. Whether you listen to hip hop or not, this war is something everybody should pay close attention to because it extends far beyond music. This is akin to politicians waging war on each other's reputations with complex strategies and propaganda that will go above the head of most people's heads aside from only affecting their subconscious in a way that will manipulate public opinion and control narrative. Today, I'll break down what you could learn from this feud and how you could apply it in your everyday life to excel further in business, outsmart competitors, and win people over in social settings. Drake understands that his controversies with underage girls is a major attack that of his, and that's precisely why he took the slim shady 8 mile approach to put his reputation's weakness on the table before Kendrick got a chance to say it first. Fake Pac tells him to attack Drake through some of the most talked about routes that could be taken to diss him, and this could have potentially just crumbled part of Kendrick's offensive effort for Drake. Drake already responded to Kendrick's like that verse with his own diss track, Push Ups, but he recently put out a creative second disc featuring Tupac and Snoop Dogg as AI. Rather than using these verses from AI, Tupac, and Snoop Dogg to diss Kendrick though, he instead used them to indirectly speak about Kendrick and Drake to manipulate the narrative before Kendrick got a chance chance to. I suspect that the primary motive behind this entire track wasn't just to rush Kendrick into posting sooner, rather it was to expose himself first so he could later dismiss anything that Kendrick had to say regarding Drake's controversy with underage girls. Liking young girls, that's a gift for me. Heard it on the button podcast, it's gotta be true. I suspect Drake realized that he had been baited by Kendrick Lamar into double downing on the Michael Jackson comparisons. Drake couldn't resist flipping Kendrick's bar, Prince outlived Mike Jack, into what's a prince to a king, he's a son. Michael Jackson has had his fair share of controversies with underage girls and boys, and I suspect that Drake realized this too late, he had fallen into a trap. Hence, this entire tailor-made freestyle was damage control for what is about to come his way, but masked by an intention of trying to rush Kendrick. Whether Kendrick sticks to using that in his diss or now changes it, we'll see. The real life chess lesson here is to never have tunnel vision when playing chess. You can't just focus on offense, you need to focus on what the other player is plotting against you. In fact, even Kendrick Lamar used this same strategy with his entire album, Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers. In this album, Kendrick openly talks about all of his flaws like cheating on his wife and his sex addiction. It makes it much harder now for him to be attacked, he's already anticipated what his future opponents will do. In life, you can never get tunnel vision when playing offense. You must always remember to anticipate what the other opponent is plotting. Lesson number two, don't underestimate the value of your pawns. In chess, pawns serve very important purposes, but many amateur players will treat them as discardable. Contrary to Kendrick, Drake has been accumulating more and more pawns to protect his reputation. Aiden Ross, DJ Academics, and many more streamers and influencers that Drake has recruited onto his side are akin to numerous pawns in a game of chess. Even if Kendrick were to hit Drake where it hurts the most, like taking his queen, it'll still be a very difficult victory considering the board is still filled with all of Drake's pawns. These pawns are being used to manipulate the narrative in this beef. Drake is shifting the public's opinion without him even having to say anything. I believe Drake is using Aiden and many others to try and control this narrative of his beef with Kendrick. And Aiden isn't the only person that is a part of this propaganda machine. See, Drake was smart enough to cultivate relationships with the likes of academics, Aiden, Kai, Speed, and many others. Yo, Drake, what's good, bro? Damn, this is crazy, bro. Now, look, hey, look. Hey, look, hey, look, hey, look you gotta understand for me, this is crazy, bro. Drake, bro, I'm a huge fan of you, bro. People that have a large influence on the internet and the youth. Now he's using some of these relationships to his advantage by spreading false narratives. And it's genius. By having Aiden Ross and DJ Academic spread false rumors about Kendrick's pre-prepared diss track, it creates a narrative that Kendrick is obsessed with Drake, and it sets expectations much higher than would be fair for his response. By overhyping this response that was said to have been prepared for years, it sets expectations unreasonably high, which typically leads to public disappointment. I had a diss song ready for Drake for four years. I think it's about time we hear that goddamn diss song. The four year mythical diss song we've never heard that's supposed to rip Drake limb from limb, hair follicle by hair follicle. 
I think it's about damn time that Kung Fu Kenny starts sending some kicks. As soon as he said it, all I saw on the timeline was this four-year-old diss track that Kendrick has kept in the vault. As you can see, this war far extends beyond just music. Drake is treating this like real war. This is real propaganda and it's working. The opinion of the masses is being manipulated and it's all because of Drake's brilliant use of his pawns. Drake even sampled DJ Academics at the end of his track, Push Ups, ensuring this massive hip hop influencer maintains his bias, almost as if he's now indebted to Drake. While Kendrick Lamar doesn't appear to be using any pawns, Metro Boomin certainly is. Metro Boomin is a very well respected producer who poured gasoline on this beat. I wouldn't say he ignited it, and I'll explain that later, but he certainly blew it up. As a producer, he can't send shots at Drake himself, so he recruited numerous other artists like Future, Kendrick, ASAP Rocky, Rick Ross, and even The Weeknd to send shots while he co signed them on his album. Metro Boomin understands that these artists may need him as a producer later down the line, in the same way that artists may need Drake later down the line for a feature. Hence, he's able to use them as pawns in the same way Drake can use the influencers as pawns. However, this also brought a major weakness to Metro Boomin's side, which is lesson number three. In psychological games like chess, appearing to be the underdog can be a major advantage. One of the greatest chess tournaments of all time was when Fischer defeated Spassky. Many people, and even the author of the 48 Laws of Power, attribute this to Fischer's unpredictability and weird behavior before and during the match. However, something that is often overlooked is how Spassky was not only the favorite in the match, but Fischer even intentionally forfeited the second game after losing the first. This put immense psychological pressure on Spassky. He now had to win. There's no way he could lose. He recognized that the entire public knew this. Being the underdog has a major advantage and Spassky was now far from that. He ended up losing the tournament in the end and I don't think it's acknowledged how much this played a factor in the psychological pressure Spassky was put under. Drake is now playing up the underdog card using lines like, what is this a 20v1? And also comparing himself to Black Mamba from Kill Bill. While Kendrick and others may not feel the same psychological pressure Spassky did in a live game, it still remains true that the public perceives Drake as the underdog giving him an advantage. In life, it could always be advantageous to play the underdog card when you want the public to side with you. And that doesn't mean not be confident, that just means make yourself appear to be an underdog. It's the same reason why many politicians always emphasize how the system is against them, even when it actually isn't the case at all. Drake wanted this all along, but of course he's going to play it like he's the victim, he's the underdog, because that's what's ideal for the public opinion. And that leads me to lesson number four, always plot and think long term. This is something obvious in the game of chess. People with high IQs tend to do very well in chess because they can think very long term, calculating and predicting combinations of what will happen multiple moves ahead. Impatient players tend to do poorly, and in the game of life, it seems like everybody is impatient. It's very rare to see someone scheme something over the course of many years. It's only something you really see in movies these days, but this is precisely what Drake has been doing. For years, he's been sending subliminals at numerous artists, including all of the ones who attacked him on Metro Boomin and Future's latest two albums. Drake wanted this all along. He wanted this 20v1. He wanted to be the underdog. He loves that he's being compared to Thanos right now. Not only this, but when we look back at what Drake was plotting years ago, it makes it appear that much more brilliant. Drake is a master at being patient. He loves the delayed gratification, something that most people just don't have the patience for. This is embodied perfectly when he raps the lyrics begin to reveal themselves over time periods. Promise you'll get that when the sky clears. In life, you will be greatly rewarded in the end if you play the long game. This requires immense patience, hence so few are capable of it. Lesson number five, never show your hand. While the saying comes from poker, the same applies with chess. It's important to not make your opportunities obvious to the other opponent because then your opponent will quickly build defenses around them. The best chess moves usually catch players off guard. This goes hand in hand with thinking long term. You need to wait for the right opportunity to exploit a weakness, and this could require a lot of patience. In fact, your opponent 
might even be baiting you with an opportunity all for it to be a trap. You should not put your offensive piece in the position it needs to be right away. You should only put it there when the time is right and it's too late for your opponent to defend or even see it coming. Drake alludes to knowing a lot more about Kendrick and others in the song by name dropping Kendrick's fiance Whitney and this is not the first time he's done it in reference to the movie Bodyguards implying that there might actually be something there but he doesn't spell it out right away. Bodyguards like Whitney which is an ode to the movie The Bodyguard starring Whitney Houston and Kevin Costner. This movie is about a bodyguard that is hired to protect Whitney and they end up falling in love. To further complicate this whole thing, Kendrick's wife's name is also Whitney, which could mean that she slept with her bodyguard. When Drake really wants to put emphasis on something, something that I noticed over the years, is he he tends to drag out his words. We saw the same thing with Duppy Freestyle when it came to Pusha's wife. Let it ring on you like Virginia Williams. And just think about it, like if this is actually true and Kendrick hired a man with his own money to protect his wife Whitney, like the movie The Bodyguard, and she really was fucking around on him, like that, this line is even more fucking crazy if, if this is true. And I'm so committed to this whole thing that I literally watched the entire movie last night with my girl, and while it didn't do much for me, it made me remember that Drake has mentioned this movie before. Bodyguards don't look like Kevin Costner, you tweaking. When we look at just how calculated Drake is, I don't believe for one second that Drake is mentioning this movie again on one of his most scathing diss records of his entire career. Just pulled up to Whitney Houston, Texas for the evening. I think this is a true subliminal in the sense that we don't get it, but Kendrick does. Even Pusha T admitted that he felt like Drake was exceptional at these types of subs. You know, uh, uh, lines here and there that I feel like, and he's really good at that, like. He's great at that. Great at that. Yeah. So Brought a line him, that like, him and under he's, the radar. And it he's can, one you know, of the best with the sub. Yeah. Look guys, where there's smoke, there's fire. Kendrick has had plenty of issues with his wife, and I'm standing on this one, Drake knows something. He does something similar by mentioning the girl Tokyo at the start, which seems to be a subliminal towards Future, implying he has some tea to spill about Future and this girl, but hasn't done it yet. Now this Tokyo line might seem simple, but it has a lot of depth, and it might just be the direct cause of the tension between Drake and Future. This is a girl that goes by the name of Just Tokyo on Instagram. Now stay with me because I'm about to blow the fucking lid off this thing. 28 weeks ago, this woman is at Drake's It's a Blur tour in Miami. Here she is posting a video of Drake performing, and here she is next to one of the trailers. Now I can't be sure, but I do see this woman as someone that Drake invited to the show, and he probably did that for a pretty good reason. However, just a few months later, she posted a series of videos for her birthday with the caption, Thank you to my Freebands fam for another celebration. For those that don't know, Freebands is Future's record label. And just a few months later, she's front and center at Future's Rolling Loud show. Here she is next to another trailer, and here she is backstage with the We Don't Trust You t-shirt, where she included the caption, Enough Said, with the date that the album dropped. What's even more interesting is that this woman has been linked to Future for years now. Here's a photo from 2021. So when Drake says, I'm out in Tokyo, I'm big in Japan, just, just think about it. The girl is Japanese. I'm the only Japanese in the family. He's saying he fucked her. Like, you know, he's big in Japan. He, he gave her the hammer. Outside of that, this line wouldn't make any sense. Statistically speaking, Drake is not big in Japan. Japan is actually one of Drake's weakest markets. He does this more directly later in the song by mentioning if Future's BM starts to kiss and tell, things might change with his relationship with Travis. He's claiming that Future's shows might look a little different if his BM, aka Baby Mama, starts to kiss and tell. First and foremost, one of Future's Baby Mamas is Sierra, who had a track Kiss and Tell. However, when I looked into this further, I found that Future has eight children with eight different women, but due to the fact that Drake uses the initials BM, I've narrowed it down to this woman right here, Brittany Mealy. 
Now, Future has had a real rocky relationship with this baby mama in particular, including a recent court battle for child support, which she won. He's keeping his chess pieces in safe positions. He's not showing his hand completely. Clearly, he has a lot more to say. That is, unless, of course, he's bluffing, that of which could be a strategic maneuver in itself. He even directly says at the end of the song, this is not everything he knows. In life, you shouldn't just use every single weapon in the first battle. In a fight, you don't use all your energy in the first round. You need to conserve in order to win the greater war. Just like chess, you need to save your opportunity for the right time. Lesson six, create dependencies. In chess, all pieces have their own unique abilities in regards to how they can move on the board. By placing them in strategic spots, you could force your opponent to depend on one of their own pieces to remain in a place in order to keep themselves protected. This makes them weaker since they can no longer use either of those pieces offensively. In the same way, your opponent may even depend on one of your own pieces to remain in a certain location in order for their piece to be protected, and once you move it, they're open to attack. Drake and Metro Boomin are both the most strategic in creating dependencies. Artists not only need good beats like Metro Boomin's, but they also understand that Metro Boomin can influence other artists to not work with them because of their own independency towards him. It's almost like a political sanction. In the same way, Drake even flaunts on how many number ones he's gotten for all these artists. Just featuring Drake on one track can blow up an entire album and ignite an artist's career. In fact, some of these artists involved in this beef had their career ignited by Drake. Henry Kissinger managed to stay in political power for so long because he entrenched himself in so many areas of political structure that getting rid of him would lead to absolute chaos. In your own job, you should find ways for others to depend on you. It'll give you more leverage to ask for compensation and climb ranks. They must fear the ramifications of getting rid of you. Finally, lesson seven is a lesson that doesn't involve those playing the game of chess, but rather those spectating. If you were given the opportunity to bet on a game of chess at any time during the game, of course you would bet as close to the end as possible. However, if you also wanted the victor to credit you for their belief in them, you'd have to choose a time earlier in the game. A bit more risky, but you'd be rewarded, if correct, for believing in them. As the game progresses, it becomes more and more clear who's more likely to win. The same applies to war. As the war wages on and both sides become weaker, it becomes more possible to gauge who will be more likely to win, especially if given additional aid. Hence, it is never ideal to commit to anybody and choose sides early on. It's smarter to wait for the war to wage on, allow both sides to become weaker, and then join in and provide aid to the side that is winning. I suspect this is what 21 Savage is doing right now. 21 Savage has always preached how important it is to pick a side, so I find it unlikely that he'll stay out of this war completely. Instead, I think he's waiting for the right opportunity to pick a side. He has always been very close with Metro Boomin, especially during his come up, but Drake recently assisted his career significantly with their collaboration album. He's in quite the predicament to say the least. Assuming he does practice what he preaches and he does pick a side, I'd guess that he is just waiting for the ideal time to pick a side, and even if that does come much farther down the line. Whether he does that or he doesn't, the lesson still remains true, especially in times of war or even investing. Before investing in one of two competitors and lending your financial aid, it's ideal to let the war play out first. And the biggest lesson to be taken from all of this is Law 5 of the 48 Laws of Power. So much depends on reputation. Guard it with your life.